Hi, welcome back to The Go Draft. My name is Andy Kurdat. I'm a working writer, have been in Hollywood for 45 years, and I'm sharing with you my thoughts and techniques on uh, screen and television writing. Um, the Go Draft, uh, in case I haven't mentioned it in a while, this is a term that used to be used anyway, that meant whoever uh, mean, meant the, the, the draft of the script that got the green light. Uh, he wrote the Go Draft, she wrote the Go Draft, that means um, they wrote the one that got made, and that's kind of the focus of what um, I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about techniques that may help you actually get your work made, and if it does get made, uh, it has a fighting chance of actually being good. No small task. Uh, we've been talking a lot about dramatic conflict in the prior uh, episode, and uh, I want to follow up on that a little bit in a different way, which is to say... Um, uh, we're still talking about dramatic conflict, but more specifically um, between actors, between characters. And um, Mel Brooks said, drama is two Jews arguing and they're both right. Uh, it doesn't have to be Jews, but it doesn't hurt. Um, but two characters who are arguing and both right, uh, that's a bit uh, of a misnomer too. All scenes are not arguments, but... Uh, the concept of the characters both being right is very important. You want to make sure that you know why all your characters think they're right. Here's some examples. Here's a clip from uh, The Fabulous Baker Boys. I've used clips from this film before because it's well written. And um, in this particular one, uh, the situation is a brother a pair of brothers who are piano players and have a lounge act. They've hired a sexy female singer to spice up the act. It works so well. She has gotten offers from other people and is moving on and doing gigs with other groups and is quitting their act. And here's the scene that comes between her and one of the brothers, the more talented of the two. And here's the scene. Jesus, you're cold. You know that? Fucking razor blade. Careful, you're gonna have me thinking you're going soft on me. You don't give a fuck, do you? About anything. What do you want from me? You want me to pay you to stay? Is that what you're looking for? You want me to get down on my knees, beg you to save the Baker boys from doom? Forget it, sweetheart. We survived for 15 years before you started onto the scene. 15 years, two seconds, you're bawling like a baby. You shouldn't be wearing a dress, you should be wearing a diaper. Jesus, you and Egghead are brothers, aren't you? Let me tell you something. Over the years, they've dropped like flies in every fucking hotel in the city. We're still here. We've never held a day job in our lives. It was an easy target, but you added up, you'll see Frank's done fine. Yeah, Frank's done great. He's uh, got the wife, the kids, the little house in the suburbs. Meanwhile, his brother's sitting in a shitty apartment with a sick dog, little orphan Annie, and a chip on his shoulder about as big as a Cadillac. Listen to me, princess. We fucked twice. That's it. Once the sweat dries, you still don't know shit about me. Got it? I know one thing. While Frank Baker was home putting his kids to sleep last night, little brother Jack was out dusting off his dreams for a few minutes. I was there. I saw it in your face. You're full of shit. Every time you walk into some shitty daiquiri hut, you're selling yourself on the cheap. I, I know all about that. I'd find myself at the end of the night with some creep and tell myself it didn't matter. And you kid yourself that you got this empty place inside where you can put it all. But you do it long enough and all you are is empty. You didn't know horrors were so philosophical. At least my brother's not my pimp. And you'll notice in that scene that uh, both characters commit, and the actors who play the characters, commit to their parts and commit to the argument and commit to the scene because they're both right. He is right when he expresses his pride over the fact that they've lasted 15 years when other groups can't hack it, uh, and how much longer they've lasted than she has, a newcomer to the business. That's correct. He's right to say that, and she's right when she accuses him of being selling himself on the cheap uh, whenever he does these lousy lounge acts when he really should be and could be working and playing at a higher level of uh, artistry. Uh, and he's right when he says, in essence, who are you to talk? Because she used to be an escort, uh, an escort service. 
Um, and when he says, I didn't never knew horrors were so philosophical, he's cruel, but it's correct. And when she says, at least my brother's not my pimp, she's right. So they're both right. And you can feel it in the performances. They're committing to their parts because they both have a legitimate point of view. Uh, when you do this, when you make sure both characters, or all the characters rather, have legitimate points of view, you allow the actors to commit to the role and commit to the scene, and that brings the level of the scene up. Uh, here's another example from a movie called Quiz Show. The situation is uh, there's the, the grown son of a renowned poet and uh, scholar and intellectual who has always felt like he's in his father's shadow, uh, has gone on a TV quiz show in the 1950s, and he's cheated in order to stay on top and stay in the public eye because he so feels outshined by his famous father. And here's the scene in which he finally has to admit what he's done to his father. What's it about exactly? Well, evidently, certain of the contestants were given the answers in advance. <laughs> Cheating on a quiz show is like plagiarizing a comic strip. Well, at any rate, it seems the committee wants to call me to uh, testify. Oh, I've testified before. Funding for the arts, it's nothing. I think this is a little different. You run circles round them. It's not exactly Jefferson and Lincoln down there anymore. I think this is a little different, Dad. I think you'd be glad of the chance to clear your name. Otherwise, people might believe. People will believe whatever they want to believe. That's not the issue. Just tell them the truth. You'll do fine. The real issue, Charlie, is how this keeps distracting you from your teaching. Oh, Dad, this and that program in the morning, though, you insist that it doesn't. Dad, I can't simply just tell them the truth. Can't tell them the truth? Why on earth not? It's, it's complicated. Complicated? Yeah, I can. Charlie, from what I understand, it's just this bunch of frauds showing off an erudition they didn't really have. All you have to do... The problem is, Dad, is it seems I was one of those frauds. What? What, what do you mean? They gave me the answers. They gave you the answers. They gave you the answers. Well, no, no. At first they just asked me questions they already knew I knew the answers to. We ran through those and I still didn't want them to actually give me the answers, so I had them give me the questions. And I'd go look up the answers on my own as if that were any different. Well, we, we ran through those in a, a couple of weeks and then I just didn't have the time. Finally, it just seemed silly, so... They gave you all that money to answer questions they knew you knew. Now, that's inflation. You're not being very helpful. I'm sorry, Charlie. I'm an old man. It's all a little difficult for me to comprehend. It's television, Dad. It's, look, it's, it's, just, it's just television. You make it sound like you didn't have a choice. What was I supposed to do at that point? Disillusion the whole goddamn country? Charlie, you took the money. Yes, I know. Yeah, I took the money. Is that what this was about? No. No, I, no, I don't know. It was a goddamn quiz show, Charlie. An ill-favored thing, sir. This is not the time to play games. But mine own. It was mine. Your name is mine. Every character uh, in your movie should think that they're the star of their movie. They are the star of their movie, just as we're all the stars of our own personal stories, our personal lives. Uh, it's just that the movie that they're the star of may not be the one that we're watching right now. It may be happening off screen somewhere, uh, usually. Anyway, there's an, a story about um, the movie Brief Encounter, which I mentioned earlier, which is a famous story, a famous movie about two middle-aged, middle-class married people who fall in love and try to have an affair, but they're, they're just not good at it. And among the things they do at one point is the man gets a key to an, uh, to an apartment, to the flat, uh, of, a, of a single guy he knows and asked to use it for the afternoon. And so they, these two people go to the, uh, go to this stranger's flat and are go trying to sort of get close to the place where they could possibly have sex. And the guy walks back in and the woman runs and hides in humiliation. And the two guys have a brief scene together. Well, Billy Wilder, the great, uh, writer director saw the film like most people of his generation and said to himself, Unlike most people, 
I wonder who that guy is who would lend people his the key to his apartment uh, to have sex and who would do that? What kind of a person would he be? And it generated in his head and he then from that he and his partner IAL Diamond wrote a great movie called The Apartment, which I've also shown you clips from um, because he just wondered that guy would be this if that guy were the star of the mo star of this movie, what an interesting story he might have to tell. Uh, so uh, it's an interesting example that doesn't happen very often of taking a minor character and turning them into the star of a movie. Uh, you should be able to make even the most seemingly indefensible character have a defensible point of view. They have to think they're right. Here's an example, an extreme example, from a great film called The Third Man. It was written by Graham Greene. And uh, in this situation, the scenario of the story, uh, it's about a black marketeer in post-war Vienna. And among the things he sells on the black market is uh, tainted medicine, including penicillin that isn't pure. And when people take it, they, they often die agonizing deaths, including children. Um, because people are so desperate for medicine in, in this post-war city. Here's a scene in which he defends his position, this in, seemingly indefensible position, this man who's a nihilist, who's amoral, who's self-centered, makes a, a, a defense of why he is the way he is. And uh, watch how Graham Greene did it. Good to see you, Harvey. Was that your funeral? It was pretty smart, wasn't it? Oh, the same old indigestion, Harvey. These are the only things that help, these tablets. These are the last. You can't get them anywhere in Europe anymore. You know what's happened to your girl? Hmm? She's been arrested. Tough, very tough, but don't worry, old man. They won't hurt her. You're handing her over to the Russians. What can I do, old man? I'm dead, aren't I? You can help somehow. Holly. Exactly. Who did you tell about me, hmm? I told the police. Unwise, Holly. And Anna? Unwise. Did the uh, police believe you? You don't care anything at all about Anna, do you? <laughs> I've got quite a lot on my mind. You wouldn't do anything. What do you want me to do? Oh, Be reasonable. Somebody else do. You expect me to give myself up. Why not? It's a far, far better thing that I do with the old limelight, the fall of the curtain. Oh, oh, Holly, you and I aren't heroes. The world doesn't make any heroes. You've got plenty of outside contact. of your stories. I've got to be so careful. I'm only safe in the Russian zone. I'm only safe here as long as they can use me. As long as they can use you. I wish I could get rid of this thing. So that's how they found out about Anna. You told them, didn't you? Don't try to be a policeman, old man. What do you expect me to be, part of part, your... You can have any part you want as long as you don't interfere. I've never cut you out of anything. So I remember when they raided the gambling joint, you knew a safe way <laughs> out. Sure. Yeah, safe for you, not safe for me. Old man, you never should have gone to the police, you know. You ought to leave this thing alone. Have you ever seen any of your victims? You know, I never feel comfortable on these sort of things. Victims. Don't be melodramatic. Look down there. Would you really feel any pity if one of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot that stopped, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spend? Free of income tax, old man. Free of income tax? The only way you can save money nowadays. A lot of good your money will do you in jail. That jail's in another zone. There's no proof against me. Besides you. I should be pretty easy to get rid of. Pretty easy. Wouldn't be too sure. I carry a gun. I don't think they'd look for a bullet wound after you hit that ground. Dug up your coffin. And found Harbin? Mm-hmm. Pity. <laughs> Holly. What fools we are, not talking to each other this way, as though I'd do anything to you. Or you to me. You're just a little mixed up about things in general. Nobody thinks in terms of human beings. Governments don't. Why should we? They talk about the people and the proletariat. I talk about the suckers and the mugs. It's the same thing. They have their five-year plans. So have I. I used to believe in God. 
Oh, I still do believe in God, old man. I believe in God and mercy and all that, but the dead are happier dead. They don't miss much here, poor devils. What do you believe in? Oh, if you ever get Anna out of this mess, be kind to her. You'll find she's worth it. I wish I'd asked you to bring me some of these tablets from home. Holly, I'd like to cut you in, old man. There's nobody left in Vienna I can really trust, and we've always done everything together. When you make up your mind, send me a message. I'll meet you any place, any time. And when we do meet, old man, it's you I want to see. Not the police. Remember that, won't you? <laughs> Don't be so gloomy. After all, it's not that awful. But what the fellow said, in Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace, and what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. So long, Holly. So, how did he defend the pure evil that he's been engaged in? And he says, among other things, uh, look down at those little dots down below. And what's the axe of the scene, by the way? It's the Ferris wheel they're riding in. Look down at those little dots. If one of them stopped moving, if I offered you X amount of money just for one dot to stop moving, would you tell me to keep my money? And if I said that, someone said that to you or to me, said, Steven Spielberg's going to make your next screenplay. There's just one catch. Somebody on the other side of the world you never met is, has to die. Would we say no? Would we say yes? It makes us think. It gives him a defensible position, and it makes the scene come to life. It's one. It's a very famous scene. It's uh, if you talk to most uh, knowledgeable <clears throat> screenwriters or uh, cineasts, cinephiles, uh, and you mention the cuckoo clock scene from Third Man, they know exactly what you're talking about because it's such a extraordinarily well written scene. Here's something that's more recent. Um, not terribly recent, but more recent than The Third Man. It's about a subject that certainly is in the news. This is, uh, imagine that you have to make a middle-aged man who seduces young women who work for him. Not sympathetic. You're never going to make him sympathetic. But you want to give him a position where he thinks he's right, where he can defend what he does. Here's how Mike Binder did it in a movie called The Upside of Anger. I'll have um, a Coke, please. Coke? Not drinking today? Okay, nice time. What is your problem? I don't have a problem. I have a nice day. Running around with young women half your age, I mean. What is that about? You manipulate young women. Use your power and title to seduce them and get them to run around with you. Yeah, so? It makes me sick, the thought of you with my daughter. Here's a tip. Don't think about it. God damn. Who should I sleep with, Terry? Woman like you? Your age? My age? I don't. You know why? Because young here women are nice. You take them out, they're actually grateful. Oh look, a steak, yummy. You go for a walk after dinner, the air smells nice. They say thank you. This was nice. This was fun, you're funny. Tee -hee. What should I do, Terry? Settle down and marry some pissed off thing like you? I'd rather have someone come over and do dental work every day from my backside up through my ass. You gonna slap me in the face again? No, probably not. Now, that's a tough position to defend, but he defended it. And while you might not agree with him, probably don't, it's still, he's right in his mind. He's a star of his movie, and that's why he thinks he's right. And because he thinks he's right, and because he has uh, 
a position that he can defend, the scene comes to life. Um, there have been a lot of movies made, especially recently, on this subject, and there's been a lot of scenes in which a female character tells off uh, a male character who is uh, guilty of this sort of behavior. And uh, there was an entire movie made about it recently, and uh, about the Harvey Weinstein uh, investigation. <clears throat> the entire film was on about this and filled with scenes like this in which the female protagonists were right and the male antagonists were wrong. And I watched it. It was okay, I guess, but I can't remember one scene. Uh, and I'll bet you can't either if you even bothered to watch it. On the other hand, you probably won't quickly forget the scene I just showed you because the character had a defensible position that forced the other character to come back and think, and force you, the viewer, to think. And, uh, and this, the drama of the scene comes to life uh, and is alive. The actor could commit to playing that part. He wasn't just a prop to be, uh, uh, to be mocked and told he was incorrect. He was an actual character. One way to approach this uh, issue is to pretend you're the actor playing the role in every part that you've written in your script. Pretend you're the actor who's playing that particular role uh, and follow that character through the story to make sure that their story tracks. Uh, you can even go so far as to highlight it the way actors do when they highlight a script, either, you know, with an actual highlighter on a piece of paper, or you can just do it on final draft with a highlighting function, uh, and then read through those parts, each one of them individually, and say, does this track, does this make sense? Because the actor will, if you're lucky enough to get it actually made, the actor will do that, and not they're not wrong when they do, to say, wait a minute, why am I saying this now? What what happened? Well, Last time I was on screen, I said this. Why am I saying this now? What do I think? What do I believe? What do I want? Uh, and you need to have answers for them. So it's a great idea to track each character separately through the film to make sure their individual stories track. Okay, now let's talk about the wonderful world of subtext. Uh, and subtext is what we mean, but we do not say. I'll give you an example. Let's pretend there's a filmmaking class, right, full of young filmmaking students, and the instructor comes in and he says, oh, I watched all your sh short scenes from yesterday, and he turns to one particular uh, young woman in class and says, but I want to tell you, your scene was fantastic. It was great. It was extraordinary. You have an enormous amount of talent. I think you have a great future in this business. Now, what does he mean? Well, maybe he means her scene was great, and she, he thinks she has a lot of talent and a great future. Maybe. Or... Now let's pretend we saw him in the hallway just before this class started and we heard him on the phone with his wife and they're having a huge argument and clearly the wife has just had an affair with somebody and he hangs up in anger and he goes into the classroom and then he turns to the young woman and says the exact same thing. Your scene was great. You have a great future, blah, blah, blah. Now, what does he mean? Well, maybe he means he wants to have an affair with her to get back at the wife. Or, let's pretend just before the class, we saw him overhearing this young woman uh, talking to another student and, and saying, yeah, my dad has like really rich, he has like $5 million he's willing to give me to make a movie if only I can find the right project. Now the instructor goes into the class and says the exact same thing. Now what does he mean? Well, maybe he means I want, to, want you to make my movie, I want you to get your dad to make my movie. Um, uh, or what if... Uh, he, uh, we saw him in the hallway just before the class and he was having a big fight with another student and they had harsh words and then he walks into the class and he turns to the young woman and says the exact same thing, how great your, your scene was and you have a great future. Now maybe he means I want that other kid to be jealous. I'm going to compliment you so he feels bad. The point is, in each case, we can change what the character means by... Uh, showing their truth rather than just having them say their truth. 
Um, and I'll show you some examples. Um, let's start here. Your job is to, is, to, is to show what the characters mean, not to simply have them say what they mean. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at some examples. Here's an example from a movie called Sideways from a few years ago. Um, and uh, all you really need to know is, is two uh, men and a woman meet in California wine country. They both are really into wine. And they have this conversation one night. I like to think about the life of wine. Yeah. How it's a living thing. I like to think about what was going on the year the grapes were growing, how the sun was shining if it rained. I like to think about all the people who tended and picked the grapes, and if it's an old wine, how many of them must be dead by now. I like how wine continues to evolve. Like, if I opened a bottle of wine today, it would taste different than if I'd opened it on any other day. Because a bottle of wine is actually alive. And it's constantly evolving and gaining complexity. That is, until it peaks. Like you're 61. And then it begins its steady, inevitable decline. And it tastes so fucking good. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, uh... I like other wines besides Pinot, too. Mm. I don't know. I mean, lately I've been really into Rieslings. You like Rieslings? Rieslings? Mm. Okay, so what is her subtext? We know what she's saying. She's talking about wine. But what does she mean? Um, obviously, it seems like you should be able to figure out what she means is, I'm interested in you, buddy. Yeah, you're kind of schlubby, but you know a lot about wine, and you're smart, and you respect me, and I'm interested in you romantically. How do we know this? Well, we can tell, of course, from the tone of the actress's voice. That's acting. Uh, we can tell from the partly from the way the uh, director placed the camera tight on her face, tight on his face, so it has an intimacy. He brought some music in. All that helps. But we can also tell from the writing, from the, what they what they say. What is she talking about? She's talking about wine in a particular way. She's talking about wine in the sense of uh, living in the moment, that the, this exact moment is important. Meaning, this moment, you and me, right here on this porch at night, is important. Take action, buddy. And then she finishes it by saying, the speech, by saying, and it tastes so fucking good. She didn't say it tastes so good. She didn't say it tastes really good. She said it tastes so fucking good. She used that uh, expletive. The writer had her use that expletive for a specific reason to bring up the subject of sex. And then she touches his hand. Her actions are telling us what she means, not her words, her actions. And what does uh, his what do, what is his subtext? His subtext is fear. He's terrified of her. He's terrified of getting involved with somebody, primarily because, as we'll discover, he doesn't want them to, to learn what a fraud he is. And so, how do we know he's afraid of her? He moves his hand. The tiniest little bit, he moves his hand, the moment is gone. They're telling us what their subtext is through their actions. Um, the actions include, of course, the choice of words and the choice of subject matter. But they're not telling us, I'm really, really attracted to you, and he's not, she's not saying that, and he's not saying, yeah, I'm really afraid of you. Their actions tell us that. Here's another scene from a great movie, uh, Citizen Kane. It's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Charles, okay. pull your muffler around your neck, Charles. Okay. 
Jane, I think we shall have to tell him now. Yes. I'll sign those papers now, Mr. Thatcher. You people seem to forget that I'm the boy's father. It's going to be done exactly the way I've told Mr. Thatcher. There ain't nothing wrong with Colorado. I don't see why we can't raise our own son just because we come into some money. If I want it, I can yes. go to court. A father has a right to. A border that beats his bill and leaves worthless stock behind. That property is just as much my property as anybody's, now that it's valuable. And if Fred Graves had any idea all this was going to happen, he'd have made out those certificates in both our names. However, they were made out in Mrs. Kane's name. He owed the money for the board to the both of us. The bank's decision on all matters... I don't hold with signing my boy away to any bank as guardian. I want you to stop because... all this nonsense, The bank's Jim. decision on all matters concerning his education, his places of residence, and similar subjects is to be the final. The idea of a bank being the guardian. I want you to stop all this nonsense, Jim. We will assume full management of the Colorado load, of which I repeat, Mrs. Kane, you are the sole owner. Where do I sign, Mr. Thatcher? Right here, Mrs. Kane. Mary, I'm asking you for the last time. Anybody think I hadn't been a good the husband sum of fifty thousand dollars a year is to be paid to you and Mr. Kane as long as you both live, and thereafter to the survivor. Well, let's hope it's all for the best. It is. Why I can't raise my own boy is more than I can understand. Go on, Mr. Thatcher. Everything else, the principal as well as all money's earned, is to be administered by the bank in trust for your son Charles Foster Kane until he reaches his 25th birthday, at which time he is to come into complete possession. Charles! Go on, Mr. Thatcher. Well, uh, it's almost five, Mrs. Kane. Don't you think I'd better meet the boy? The father in that scene is saying, how dare you do this? I don't agree with this. You want some bank to be able to be a legal guardian of my kid just so that we can get some money that happened to be inherited. I don't agree with this. You'd think I wasn't a great father, blah, 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 blah. But as soon as a guy says you're going to get X amount of money every year, well, let's hope this is for the best, he says. And what does he do? He closes the window. Why? So he can't hear that kid outside uh, yelling and happily playing. Why? Because he's guilty. And what does the mother do, who is the one behind this, who's uh, going to take the money in order to let this bank raise their kid in order to keep the money? Uh, she goes and she raises the window and stares out into the cold, bitter, uh, snowy day and yells to the kid. What is her subtext? She opened the window because she's going to feel the brunt of what she's done, the icy cold truth of this harsh action she's just taken. The characters are showing us what they mean. They're not saying what they mean. Um, here's another one uh, from a, another great movie called Strangers on a Train. And it's been redone many times in different forms, but the basic setup is two guys happen to meet on a train by pure accident. They get to talking. They each discover there's somebody in their lives they wouldn't mind if they were dead. Uh, in one guy's case, he has a nasty wife who won't give him a divorce, and he's fallen in love with somebody else. And in the other guy's case, he has a father he can't stand. And they make a kind of a joking around. Wouldn't it be funny if we swapped murders? You kill your person, I'll kill yours, and nobody would ever trace it back to us. Uh, but one of the guys took it seriously, and then this happens. doing here at this time of night? Well, you don't seem very pleased to see me. I brought you a little present. What do you mean? Oh, what's this all about? Recognize them? It was very quick, guy. She wasn't hurt in any way. It was all over in no time. I knew you'd be surprised. Guy, there's nothing for us to worry about. Nobody saw me. Only Miriam. And I was very careful, Guy. Even when I dropped your cigarette lighter there, I went back to pick it up. 
Are you trying to tell me? Why, you maniac! That guy, you wanted it. We planned it on the train together, remember? Where are you going? Then? Where do you think I'm going? I'm going to call the police, of course. But you can't, guy. We'd both be arrested for murder. We'd both be arrested for murder. You're just as much in it as I am. We planned it together. Crisscross. Are you, you crazy that? fool? Do you think you can get away with that? Oh, come now, guy. Why should I go to Metcalf to kill a total stranger? Unless it was part of the plan and you were in on it. You're the one who benefits, guy. You're a free man now. I didn't even know the girl. I had nothing to do with this. The police will believe me. Guy, if you go to the police now, you'll just be turning yourself in as an accessory. You see, you have the motive. What is it? My telephone. Someone has some news for you, guy. It's the police. So, what does the innocent man uh, show? How does he show his truth? The truth being, I'm not really that innocent. I am going to profit from this. I am guilty. I am part of this mentally. I didn't actually do it, but I feel like I'm going to benefit. And how do we know this? Because when the cop shows up, he steps behind the gate and into the shadows along with the murderer. He doesn't go to the cop and say, this guy's over here. He's the guy who did the murder. He hides in the shadows because he's showing his truth. His behavior tells us what his truth is, and that is, I'm not really that innocent. Um, you know, I, uh, years ago, I, uh, my daughter was going to high school, and uh, I used to drive her to school and uh, drop her off, and they had a security guard there at the parking lot. And one day I had to go into the office to do something. I came out, and I was walking by his little kiosk there, and then, <clears throat> A horn must have honked or a kid shouted just as he said good morning to me and I didn't hear him and as I walked past he suddenly stepped out in front of me and got right in my face and said I said good morning now he said good morning but when he said good morning he didn't mean good morning what he meant was who wants to fight uh, when men on a construction site uh, you know Cat call women walking by. Hey, baby, you want some of this? Come on up here. What are they actually saying? We hear, we know what the words are, mean that they're saying, but what do they actually mean? Do they actually think a woman is actually going to climb up onto the construction site to find out what they've got for her? Uh, I think probably in the history of the world that has never happened. So why are they saying that since we know that's not going to happen? My guess is, because they usually say it when they're in groups, not alone, is what they're really saying is, hey, fellas, check me out. I'm not gay. Look how manly I am. Um, they're not saying their truth. They do not speak their truth. People rarely say what they mean. They have a hidden agenda. And that's the fun for a dramatist is to figure out what that hidden agenda is and expose it. Um, I'll show you an example of it in uh, this clip from the movie Crimes and Misdemeanors. It's pretty self-explanatory. A very wealthy doctor has a married doctor, has a perfect life, but he's been having an affair. And the woman he's having an affair with has decided, I want you to tell your wife. And he doesn't want to. And he's tried to talk her out of it. He tried to buy her out of it. Nothing has worked. And then he calls his brother and this happens. Stoop to call me. I mean, to actually invite me to your home. Come on, Jack. Don't hit me while I'm down. I mean, who should I turn to but a brother? I've been there for you. I'm here, aren't I? No, make sharp cracks. I didn't stoop to call you. I'm in serious trouble. She won't take money. She won't listen to reason. I even toyed with the idea of telling everything to Miriam, but she'd never be able to live with it. Add to that a blabbing about my financial indiscretion. Not that I stole, but I, I was indiscreet and. If they look hard enough, who knows what they'll find. What would you like me to do? I don't know, but she's killing me. 
Want me to have somebody talk to her? Like what? Straighten her out. What do you mean? Threaten her? That's all I need. How else do you expect to keep her quiet? I don't know. Jack, I don't know. Well. Price Jack, why do you suggest? What did you call me for? I don't know. I, I hoped you'd have more experience with something like this. You called me because you needed some dirty work done. That's all you ever call for. Look how bitty you are. Hey, you've staked me plenty of times. I don't forget my obligations. Threatening will only make it worse, Jack. Okay, forget about it. What do you want me to say? How the hell can I forget about it? I'm fighting for my life. This woman's going to destroy everything I've built. That's what I'm saying, Judah. If the woman won't listen to reason, then you go on to the next step. What? Threats? Violence? What are we talking about here? She can be gotten rid of. I mean, I know a lot of people. Money will buy whatever's necessary. I'm not even going to comment on that. That's mind-boggling. Well, what did you want me to do when you called me? Not to do dirty work, despite what you think. Anyway, it's gone beyond just Miriam now. She's... She's talking financial doings. I... I'm out of ideas. I don't know what I expected from you, Jack, but... You know, you're not aware of what goes on in this world. I mean, you sit up here with your four acres... Don't give me any and your country club, I don't want to hear about my success. ...and your rich friends, and out there in the real world, it's a whole different story. Come on. I've met a lot of characters from when I had the restaurant... I know you have. I've heard these stories before. ...from 7th Avenue, from Atlantic City. And I'm not so high class that I can avoid looking at realities. I can't afford to be aloof... And you come to me with a hell of a problem, and uh, then you get high-handed on me. Jack, I don't mean to be high-handed. I haven't been sleeping nights. I'm irritable, okay? Okay. Okay, forget I said anything. Let me just get something straight here. Am I understanding you right? I mean, are you suggesting getting rid of her? You won't be involved. But I'll need some cash. What will they do? What will they do? They'll handle it. I can't believe I'm talking about a human being, Jack. She's not an, an insect. You don't just step on her. I know. Playing hardball was never your game. You never liked to get your hands dirty. But... Apparently, this woman is for real, and this thing isn't just going to go away. I can't do it. I can't think that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, sorry about the video quality of that clip, by the way. Uh, it's the only one I could find. Um... So what does the doctor, the rich doctor, want in that scene? He wants to kill her. He wants his mistress to be dead. He doesn't say it. In fact, he says the opposite. How do we know that's what he wants? Because he won't stop talking about it. His brother says, okay, forget it. And he keeps talking about it. She's killing me, he says even. Uh, he's behaving his truth. He's not saying what he means, but we can figure it out because it's been well written, in this case by Woody Allen. Um, to so that we can feel, sense what he himself doesn't would never admit. I want her to be dead. Um, here's another example. <clears throat> this time from a comedy. Uh, it's called Ghost Town, and um, it's uh, uh, in it. Uh, a patient this guy has gone in for a minor operation. He dies for a few minutes on the operating table, and then when he is resuscitated, he can now see dead people. He can see ghosts. Uh, so he comes in back to the hospital in order to try to find out what happened. Uh, and here's the scene. From the moment I left the hospital. Um, what what kind of side effects? Hallucinations. Um, okay, visual or oral? Both. And really vivid, really realistic, weird. I mean, <laughs> that's not normal. Well, and you know, <laughs> what's normal, you know, really? It's... Well, not having hallucinations, I'd have thought. Did anything unusual happen during my procedure? Did, did anything? 
Sorry, Wait, it, but did anything... Why you just keep talking when I'm talking? Why do you keep interrupting me? No, well... Did anything unusual kind happen? You kind of inter interrupted me a little bit. Just answer this. Did anything, anything unusual happen? Where? What do you mean, where? That's not a proper response. Yes or no? Did anything unusual happen during my procedure? Yeah. Right. No. You said yes first. No. It's what I ended with. Yes, no means no. Did anything um, unusual happen during my um, procedure? Please, uh, and if so... Can, can you hold on one second? Well... Can you hold on a second? Yeah, it's, uh, it's me. Um, can you stop what you're doing and come down here right away? Um, is that thing that we talked about? Yeah, well, you told me to call you if it came back, and it came back, so... Okay. What was that? What's the thing you told someone the thing came back? Oh, I have a rash on my back. It came back, so I had to call my doctor. You... Miss? Yes. Me? Mm -hmm. What the... Can you, um... What? Can I... Follow you? Yes. To the... To the, my office. And then you'll tell me. What's the subtext that the that the doctor, Chris, Kristen Wiig, is playing? Subtext is she knows what she did. She knows she's at fault and she's desperately trying to cover it up. In comedy, uh, in, th in this case, you're watching two of the great comic actors of, the, of their generation, you know, Ricky Gervais and Kristen Wiig. Uh, in comedy, what we often do is allow the subtext to pop up behind the character so we, the audience, can see it clearly, but they don't see it. So she would never admit it. The whole course of the scene in the movie, she never admits she's done anything wrong, but she knows she has, and she's trying to hide it. That's her subtext. That's why it's funny. Uh, here's another example from another comedy, The Big Lebowski, written by the Coen brothers. Woo! <laughs> I'm slamming it tonight. You guys are dead in the water. All right, way to go, Donnie! If you want, it is no dream. Fucking 20 minutes late, man. What the fuck is that? Theodore Herzl. Huh? State of Israel. If you will it, dude, it is no dream. What the fuck you talking about, man? The carrier. What's in the fucking carrier? Huh? Oh, Cynthia's dog. I think it's a Pomeranian. Oh, I can't leave him home alone or he eats the furniture. I'm watching it while Cynthia and Marty Ackerman are going to You brought a fucking Pomeranian bowling? You brought it bowling? I didn't rent it shoes. I'm not buying it a fucking yeah. beer. He's not taking your fucking turn, dude. Man, if my fucking ex-wife asked me to take care of her fucking dog while she and her boyfriend went to Honolulu, I'd tell her to go fuck herself. Why can't you board it? First of all, dude, you don't have an ex. Secondly, this is a fucking show dog with fucking papers. You can't board it, it gets upset. Hey, its man. hair falls out. Walter. Fucking no. dog has fucking papers. <laughs> over the line! Huh? I'm sorry, Smokey, you were over the line, that's a foul. Bullshit, market eight, dude. Uh, excuse me, market zero, next frame. Bullshit, Walter, market eight, dude. Smokey, this is not nom, this is bowling, there are rules. Hey, Walter, come on, it's just, hey man, it's Smokey, so his toe slipped over a little, you know, it's just a game, man. This is a league game. This determines who enters the next round robin. Am I wrong? Yeah, but I wasn't. Am I wrong? Yeah, but I wasn't over. Give me the marker, dude, I'm marking an eight. Smokey, my friend, you're entering a world of pain. Walter, man. You mark that frame an eight, you're entering a world of pain. I'm not. A world of pain. Well, look, dude, I, this is your partner. Has the whole world gone crazy? Am I the only one around here who gives a shit about the rules? Market zero. They're calling the cops, man. Put the piece away. Market zero. Walter, put the piece away. Walter? You think I'm fucking around here? Market zero. All right, it's fucking zero. You happy, you crazy fuck? The league game smoke. And by the way, the uh, Ghost Town uh, was written by David Kep, and I believe his name was Joe Campos, I think, um, or John Campos. Anyway, uh, and uh, Strangers on a Train was written by Raymond Chandler, the great uh, noir novelist, and uh, I believe his name was Zenzi Ormond. Uh, from a novel by Patricia Highsmith. Um, <clears throat> so in the scene we just watched from The Big Lebowski, 
the Coen brothers have essentially told you what the subtext of the John Goodman character, Walter, what his subtext is. He spends a whole movie like this, switching back and forth between sounding reasonable and exploding with fury. What is his subtext? Well, they just told you in that scene, he's watching the dog that belongs to his ex-wife while she goes to Hawaii with her new lover. Gee, anybody want to guess why he's consumed rage but cannot admit it, would never admit it? He thinks he's perfectly rational. Uh, and that, uh, that subtext popping up constantly is what makes the character so funny. Um, incidentally, whenever I'm working with bad actors, uh, I know they're bad actors when they say, um, what, what do I want in this scene? What, my, what does my character want? Which is not, a, there's nothing wrong with them asking that. That's a reasonable question. And then when you explain what it is they want, they say, well, then why don't I just say that? And of course, the answer to that is because you, the actor, know what your character wants. I just told you. But your character doesn't know what your character wants. Uh, and of course, if you're lucky, you say, and you're a terrible actor, get off my set. But that doesn't often happen. Um, there's a reason why we write with subtext. Two reasons, at least. The first is that it's just way more fun for the audience to discover the truth about the characters than to have it told to them. It's more fun to discover it. It makes them lean in to the story and pay attention. And the second is it's more truthful. It's more accurate. It's the way human beings actually behave. The reason why it's more truthful is not only do we not say what we mean most of the time, we don't know what we mean most of the time. John Goodman's character doesn't know that's why he's angry. Paul Giamatti's character didn't know why he pulled his hand away uh, when, when this woman was uh, very overtly, fairly overtly, uh, telling him, I'm available and I'm willing. Uh, he didn't, couldn't tell you why he did that. The father in the Citizen Kane scene doesn't know what he means uh, when he succumbs to this uh, temptation of taking the money. Uh, he wouldn't have admitted it. He didn't know it. He would have passed a lie detector test. They all would have probably. We don't know what we mean in real life. If we did know what we meant all the time, there would be no need for therapists. And there are plenty of therapists in the world and they're all very busy. Most of us in real life are lucky if we figure out what we mean in, a, in an important way two or three times in our lives. Um, in my own case, I, I tell you this only because it's, uh, it's also uh, instructive about uh, screenwriting and being in the show business. Uh, my father died when I was quite young, before I'd had any success. I was dropped out of college. I had no job. I was nowhere. Uh, when he passed away. Uh, and so I then got a job, saved my money, came to Hollywood. It's pretty easy to see. Yeah, my father's death probably motivated me to do that. Okay, great. But while I was here for many, many decades, working very ambitiously, uh, taking almost any job that came along, usually working for an older man than, you know, producer, or a star, or a star director, usually men, usually older. And I would do, my God, I would work Christmases. I would work 24 hours straight. I would do anything to try to make, uh, uh, make a success of it. And only much later in life did I finally realize, oh my God, I did that, not just because I was blindly ambitious, but because I was trying to get a metaphorical pat on the head from a father figure, someone who would say, I'm proud of you, son, uh, because my father wasn't able to do that because he never saw any of my success. That's a blinding revelation that happened with only with someone's help well into my adulthood. Uh, you're lucky if that happens to you just a few times. The rest of the time I was blindly going about behaving what I meant, but not knowing what I meant. And I certainly couldn't have said it. I think that's probably true of almost all of us or all of us. Um, something similar to it. There are people, as we know, who go through life never having any insight into why they behave the way they do. Um, and there are people who also say, oh, that's not me. I'm a straight shooter. I always say what I mean. Well, probably not. Uh, 
the truth is people who go around saying that uh, are probably saying that because they're hiding something. Sometimes I know from personal experience, people are always bragging about what a straight shooter, what an honest person they are, are saying it because they're actually fairly cruel and they like saying mean things to people and making them feel low, presumably so they'll feel better about themselves. And it's a great smoke screen to constantly be telling people you're such a straight shooter. That's why I say those mean things. Um, otherwise, why would they go around saying that? They wouldn't have to, right? Dogs don't bark because they're strong and powerful. Dogs bark because they're weak and frightened. Um, you know, bullies are bullies because they're weak, not because they're strong. Um, I can think we can all agree that probably one sentence Albert Einstein never said was, by the way, I'm really smart, you know. Uh, he didn't have to. He just kept saying and doing really smart things. We got it. It was sort of like, be like Shaquille O'Neal walking into a room and saying, oh, hi, by the way, I'm really tall. No kidding, Shaq. Um, so often you'll find that why a character says something is just as important or more important than what it is they say. Here's an example uh, one of many examples, but it's from a movie called The English Patient, uh, and it was written by Anthony Minghella, written and directed by Anthony Minghella. And uh, the only setup you need, I think, is that it's a group of archaeologists in the desert of North Africa just before World War II, and uh, a, wom a woman and her husband have joined the expedition recently, and they have a little um, tradition around the campfire because they have nothing else to do to entertain themselves is that they spin a bottle and whoever it points at has to get up and sing a song or tell a joke or a story or something and now it's her turn uh, and there's she has had a prickly uh, testy relationship with one particular archaeologist who seems to resent her presence played by Ray Fiennes the woman is played by uh, Kristen Scott Thomas and here's the scene Kanjalis tells Gaijis that the Queen has the same practice every night. She takes off her clothes and puts them on the chair by the door to her room. And from where you stand, you will be able to gaze on her at your leisure. And that evening, it's exactly as the King has told him. She goes to the chair, and removes her clothes one by one, until she's standing naked in full view of Gaijis. And indeed, she was more lovely than he could have imagined. But then, the queen looked up and saw Gaijis concealed in the shadows. And although she said nothing, she shuddered. And the next day, she sends for, for Gaijis and challenged him. And hearing his story, this is what she said. Off with his head. <laughs> she said, either you must submit to death for gazing on that which you should not, or else kill my husband who has shamed me, and become king in his place. So Gyges kills the king, marries the queen, and becomes ruler of Lydia for 28 years. The end. Should I spin the bottle? So why did she tell that story? That particular story about a queen who disrobed in front of a guy and then was so shamed because her husband had let him do it in order to show off his beautiful wife that she says, you're going to have to kill my husband. Why in the world did she choose to tell that story around this campfire? What's the subtext? Um, she is metaphorically stripping herself naked in front of this man who she clearly is attracted to. And how do we know he's attracted to her? What is his behavior? What is his subtext? When she finally, she looks at everybody else and then her eyes finally land on his and he looks away from her. He doesn't look at her. He looks away because he is thinking horrible thoughts. Uh, it's a scene that is ripe with subtext. Um, and when he looks back at her, by the way, she looks away, which is interesting. Uh, here's another example. This is a last scene of a great film, which I showed you a clip from earlier, Crimes and Misdemeanors. It is a truly um, important film, really 
really well made and about a powerful subject. And just a backdrop, if you haven't seen the film, it's, a, it's two stories, two parallel stories about one person who gets, commits a crime and another person who has a lot of misdemeanors committed against him. And the, I already told you about the married wealthy doctor who winds up paying for a hitman to kill his wife, and he gets away with it. He's expecting uh, to be arrested and tried and convicted, and it never happens. And the other character is a schlubby documentary filmmaker. His life is falling apart. Nobody likes his movies. Uh, his wife is leaving him. The woman he's fallen in love with is chosen uh, to go off instead with a um, with a very successful but kind of sleazy TV producer. And they happen to meet at the end of the movie. These two parallel stories finally intersect at a wedding that they both happen to be invited to. And this is what happens. Off by yourself, huh? You're like me. I always get sad at these kind of events. You look very deep in thought. <clears throat> I was plotting the perfect murder. Yeah? Movie plot? Movie? Well, Ben, uh, that's what Ben told me. He says you make films. Yeah, but not that kind. I, you know, a different kind. I have a great murder story. Yes? Great plot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've had too many to drink. I mean, forgive me, I... I know you want your privacy. No, it's okay. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing anything special. Except my murder story has a... very strange twist. <clears throat> yeah. Let's say there's this man who who's very successful. He has everything. Let me ask you something. Am I a phony? Are you what? Am I a phony? What are you talking about? Are you a little high or something? No, I'm... You know, I think he hates me. Who hates you? Your annoying husband. He's, uh, he's, every time I'm with him, I, I get uh, I get tense, you know? It's just that he's angry, you know that. Well, at, you know what? That at what? At what? At what? Are you yeah. kidding me? He's got these fantasies about changing the world. This is a man who thinks he can change them. He makes yeah. these films, and in the end, they come to nothing. They're nothing. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Mike. He's got to grow up. I mean, this is the real world. This is the big time. They don't... They don't pay off on high aspirations. You got to deliver, you know. Tell me. I mean, and, and not to mention the fact that I, I mean, I can't believe it. You're, you're still young. You're not getting the life that you deserve, you know. Lester, I met somebody. Oh, that. Oh, <laughs> that is music to my ears. Yeah. And after the awful deed is done, he he finds that he's plagued by deep-rooted guilt, little sparks of his religious background which he'd rejected, or suddenly stirred up. He hears his father's voice. He imagines that God is watching his every move. Suddenly, it's not an empty universe at all, but a, a just and moral one, and he's violated it. Now he's panic-stricken. He's on the verge of a mental collapse, an inch away from confessing the whole thing to the police. And then, one morning, he awakens. And the sun is shining and his family is around him. Mysteriously, the, the crisis is lifted. He takes his family on a vacation to Europe and as the months pass, he finds he's not punished. In fact, he prospers. The killing gets attributed to another person, a drifter, who has a number of other murders to his credit, so, I mean, what the hell, one more doesn't even matter. Now he's scot-free. His life is completely back to normal. Back to his protected world of wealth and privilege. Yes, but can he ever really go back? 
Well, people carry sins around with them. I mean, oh, maybe once in a while he has a bad moment, but it passes. And with time, it all fades. Yeah, but but so then you know, then his worst his worst beliefs are realized. Well, I said it was a chilling story, didn't I? <laughs> I don't know. It, it'd be, I think it'd be tough for somebody to live with that. You know, it's, very few guys could could actually live. You know, to live with something like that on their conscience. I mean, people carry awful deeds around with them. And what, what what do you expect them to do? Turn himself in? I mean, this is reality. In reality, we we rationalize, we deny, or we we couldn't go on living. Here's what I would do. I would have him turn himself in, because then you see, then your story assumes tragic proportions. Because in the absence of a god or something, he is forced to assume that responsibility himself. Then you have re then you have tragedy. But that's fiction. That that's movies. I mean, I mean, you see too many movies. I mean, I'm talking about reality. I mean, if you want a happy ending, you you should go see a Hollywood movie. <laughs> Now, what is the subtext of the doctor when he tells this story? Tells the story his, of what really happened to him in the vague form of a fictional story that he's made up. What is his subtext? Is he guilty? He has profited. He seems to be past it. His conscience doesn't seem to be bothering him. He seems like a perfectly happy guy, much happier than the other guy. Is he guilty? Well, you, it's subject to uh, discussion like most great films, but I would argue that yes, he is. Why? Because he told the story. Why did he feel the need to confess in this form to a total stranger at a wedding, except that he felt some level of guilt over what he's done and the fact that he got away with it? Um, that's what makes for a great movie, uh, and that is great screenwriting. Uh, okay, we're going to move on to more discussion of scene writing, and especially we're going to get into the differences, which we just touched on a bit. We're going to into more of the distinction between comedy and drama, among many other things, dialogue and so on. Coming up soon. Thanks. <laughs>